And when we look back historically, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see uh, algebraic thinking going back a long way. It certainly wasn't symbolic algebraic in the sense we have now. Although, let me nuance that, because I've already referred to that implicitly. There's two issues. There's how did they record what they were doing? How did they write down on their tablets and whatever, their parchment? How did they write down algebra, or arithmetic for that matter? And then the other issue is, how did they do it? Well, they've always, it's always been done symbolically. It's hard to imagine how you could do it without some kind of scratching of some sort of abstract symbols. But when they wrote it down, for many centuries, it was written down in words. And I, I alluded to that last week in, in connection with, with uh, Leonardo Fibonacci, or maybe it was two weeks ago, that when, before the printing press, when things were written down, they had to be written down in a manner that allowed fairly reliable copying, and the, the writers knew that the scribes would be literary people that could probably get most of the words right, but they wouldn't necessarily understand the symbols. And, you know, one, one symbol that's written wrongly can turn a correct result into an incorrect result, can turn something sensible into gibberish. So in order to, be, to, to give some guarantee that results would be preserved when, uh, when things were copied, um, most things were written in words. And, but, the, but it was always done symbolically. So in, uh, one of the things you'll find on, on some websites is a distinction between rhetorical algebra and symbolic algebra. That's, that's, that's sort of missing the point. It wasn't that there was a different kind of algebra. It was just the distinction between how it was written and how it was done. <coughs> um, so we get this evidence of, uh, of the Babylonians doing something that was essentially algebraic. Uh, it, was, it was very much couched in terms of geometric problems. Um, but some of these, and some were very, very practical, some of them were actually numerical problems that were couched in, algebraic t in geometric terms, and some just seemed to be recreational. <laughs> um, and even though they didn't have notational devices for talking about variables and general cases, they talked in terms of specific numbers, it was clear just as we do with modern recipes very often, you know, take two cups of this and three cups of that, and you just assume you can double or triple any of the units. Uh, it was clear that they applied in general. But it was, with hindsight, this was algebraic thinking. Um, okay, uh, and indeed to the degree of having an unknown, an unknown that you reason about. Uh, the unknown wasn't a, wasn't a number, it, this was geometric, so the unknown was a line. That's algebra. We might want to call it geometric algebra just to be clear about it. But again, this is a modern term. You know, they were just doing their stuff. Uh, they were just trying to solve problems and, and in some cases just to have a good time. Uh, and as I mentioned a moment ago, sometimes uh, they would do this to solve arithmetic problems. That, that's a feature that we can see later on uh, in the work of Omar Khayyam and so forth, that it was a geometric approach to essentially numeric problems. And here's one. I think I got at least as far as this last time. Um, this problem, uh, which I've translated from base 60 into uh, modern decimal notation. And it was written in, in words. I added the second, the area of my two squares, then I put it in decimal notation, and expressed a problem. And then they gave a geometric solution, a procedure, an algorithm, if you like, an algorithm for solving it. Um, in modern terms, um, I express the area of my two squares, x squared plus y squared, and the area, added them together, is 1525, and then another condition gives me that equation. So I've got two equations, one quadratic, one linear, and you have to solve them. That's pretty sophisticated. Um, yeah, it's pretty sophisticated in symbols, but if you're thinking about it geometrically, I think most people today, <coughs> though we could easily solve that using algebraic procedures, uh, geometrically, that, uh, I would find that a bit of a challenge geometrically. Um, this kind of problem was solved all over the place. You, you get the Egyptians doing it in the Rhine Papyrus, uh, Chinese. Th these are famous works from history, and the early Greeks in, in Euclid's Elements. Um, but in those cases, it's, it would fall, I would say, and most historians I've, I've consulted, uh, which is not a lot, but I've at least consulted modern historians, um, would say that that's not very algebraic. Uh, yeah, I, I should mean I'm drawing on, so when I wrote my book on Fibonacci, uh, The Man of Numbers, I consulted with three of the leading scholars, one Italian and two American, on medieval period, actually the, 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 the pre-medieval period, the sort of the, the Arabic-Persian period in the 8th, 9th centuries, 
and, uh, and then the, the medieval period in Italy. I consulted with three of the best modern scholars on those areas. And I'm, I'm pulling on those guys uh, for my information rather than, and none of them have written books. Actually, that's not quite true. Um, one of them has written some books, but not, none of the three have really written a lot about what they know, not in the form of a book. So their, their knowledge hasn't really filtered onto the, uh, onto the internet yet. <coughs> okay. And I think, that's, I think I did get as far as this. Um, you know, whereas we would do a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, the Greeks and others would think of that geometrically in terms of actual areas. You know, we talk about x squared, but the, the word square indicates that there's a square floating around. So a plus b squared, that means there's a square with sides of a plus b. And you'll find that kind of thing, this kind of geometric reasoning, rather than algebraic reasoning, in all of those famous works. Um, then we get something that really is beginning to look like modern algebra, um, absent the x's and the y's and the z's, which we're not going to come to the 16th century. And this is Diophantus, uh, who wrote this multi-volume book, uh, Arithmetica. I mean, the, you know, the, the word arithmetic is actually in the title, but this is really arithmetic done from a higher order perspective. Um, it really was algebraic thinking. Uh, we can recognize it as algebra. Absent the symbols, we can rec and there are, there are symbols, but they're not the, the familiar modern x, y's, and z's, and so forth. Um, but there was definite introducing an, uh, an unknown and then reasoning logical solving equations. Uh, and that was around 150, 250 uh, current era. Um, so there were these letters, but that's, you know, it, it's not symbolic algebra in the modern sense, but it certainly is algebra. Uh, negative numbers were used. And he used these techniques that we'll see in a moment, uh, restoration and confrontation, uh, moving things from one side of an equation to another, eliminating like terms from both sides. Uh, and solved, use, the, use these methods to solve polynomials well, up, to, up to degree six. Okay, now let's, I don't think I got as far as this. I think this is where I stopped last time. Okay, so the, if we want to trace a historical thread now beyond Diophantus, then uh, we'll go into India, Brahmagupta, around uh, 600 current era, and he wrote this book, which I am not even going to attempt to pronounce, um, but it roughly means something like Correctly Established Teachings of Brahma. Um, that's, there's some disagreement exactly when zero appeared, but this is uh, one of the, certainly one of the first uh, clear appearances of zero, meaning that there's a discussion of the properties of zero, you know, that you add zero to anything, you don't change it, you multiply by zero, you get zero, that kind of a discussion. Very recognizable algebra, again, absent the modern X, Y, and Z gloss. And then um, solution of quadratic equations, including zero and negative numbers. So that's very well established uh, around six 600 or so current era. Then the next huge step, and this is that path that I alluded to in connection with Fibonacci, where you begin down in India with the Hindu-Arabic numerals, then the, 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 the Arabic-speaking, Persian-speaking traders moving that up uh, towards North Africa and then crossing the Mediterranean into Italy. And so there were three seminal figures from a historical perspective. There's Brahmagupta, and then there's Al-Khwarizmi, and then there's Leonardo. You know, they, they were just three, and, and essentially what they did that was distinct was they each wrote a book that survived. You know, if you want to change things, you can write, you can do all sorts of things, but if you want to have a major effect on history and be recognized, writing a big book is, is, is often a good way. Uh, you know, we regard Euclid as being the guy who arbitrated geometry. It's not clear that Euclid did any of the work that he originated any of the work in his book, he probably did, but the real power of Euclid's elements is the way it was organized, made systematic, and made available to us, and laid out in a nice way. Uh, and the same was true with al Khwarizmi, wrote two very important books, and likewise with Leonardo. You clearly have to be very good to do that, but you're, a lot of the work is collection. You know, that's why I end up comparing Leonardo to Steve Jobs. You just make a really good job of collecting it, marketing it, and making it accessible. And that's how to influence the world.
Stanford University.